Bibles tonight, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we make our way back to our to our series through 1 Thessalonians. Now we're coming to verse 13. We'll read verses 13 through 18 tonight. And uh, certainly this is um, uh, one of the great passages that talks to us about a doctrine that we call the rapture. You won't find the word rapture in here, but you will find the idea of what rapture means, being caught up there in verse 17. And we have some Bible doctrine that we use certain words for that the words are not necessarily found in Scripture, but the words describe what is found in Scripture, such as the word Trinity. You won't find that in Scripture, but it certainly describes uh, these three are one, Trinity, triunity. And, uh, and such is the case with uh, the rapture here. Now, uh, I, I'm not really talking about the rapture tonight and uh, we're, we're going to have to come back to this passage, okay? There's a lot in this passage that we need to look at, uh, and, and uh, there's just no way we're going to fit it all in tonight. So let me take something that uh, is, has been on my heart uh, uh, about this passage, and let's start there, and then we'll come back to the passage uh, and, and look at uh, something else in uh, perhaps even next Sunday night. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent... It's a word that has the idea of go before or proceed, them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want us to just very simply tonight draw our attention to verse 14, where he says, For if we, and what's the next word? Believe. believe. For if we believe. Now the word if sometimes means we might or we might not, but that's not the case with the usage of this word here. If we believe was a statement of fact that he did believe, and they should believe. He's going to turn around in 1 Corinthians, and uh, he's, he's going to write, uh, we, we look at it as a, an entire chapter, in chapter 15, talking to them about Christ being risen from the dead. If Christ isn't risen from the dead, uh, we don't have hope, our faith is in vain, we're of all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and he's got that thing settled. So he says, for if we believe, that Jesus died and rose again, then what follows is, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And when we talk about the rapture uh, more uh, thoroughly, uh, then we'll, we'll deal with some of those elements. But right now, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing us to this point of for if we believe, and that word believe or belief. I saw the truth of those four words on May the 13th, no, May the 14th, May the 14th, 2014. Mom had died the day before, and uh, uh, Dad was in enough health at that moment to, uh, to go with me to the funeral home. So he and I went to the funeral home down there at Connor Westbury, and we sat there in the office with Mike, and, and um uh, Dad was, Dad was uh, making funeral arrangements and decisions regarding all the different things that uh, you have to make. How many of you have actually sat in one of those little rooms and made all those decisions? Yeah, it's a lot of stuff, isn't it? And, of course, they're catching people at, at the time of, uh, of great emotion and so forth. By the way, I am thankful for honest funeral people. 
That, that's an industry where it's real easy to take advantage of people in their time of, in their time of grief. So I'm, th- I'm thankful. I'm thankful for honest um, funeral people who, who aren't just trying to take advantage of, of, of the situation. And I, in my dealings with Mike over the years, it's, uh, I, he's not paying me. He probably should be for this commercial. Um, but uh, he's, he, he's, he's been good. He's been good. And so uh, we, we were sitting there in the room, and, you know, you've got all the different things. And I've sat there with I don't know how many people throughout the years and, 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 uh, and been there to be a, a guide and an assist and so forth. But uh, um, we came to a discussion of, of, I think it probably had to do with the vault and caskets and so forth. And, and um, anybody in the funeral industry will tell you if they're honest, that they can really play on the emotions of people and emphasize certain things regarding caskets and vaults and just jack up the price big time based based on uh, your feeling of wanting to do right by your loved one and so forth. And uh, Dad, of course, was having his own physical battles at the time, and and uh, and I knew what I thought about it, but it was uh, you know it was Mom, so it was Dad's final decision on that and. Mike looked at Dad and said, Mr. McIntyre, he said, if we really believe such and such, he says, uh, that'll, that'll help us in making our decisions. He was talking about our Christian belief system. He was including himself in that statement, by the way. He said, we know where she's at, and she's not in that casket, and she's not going to be in that uh, that hole in the ground either. And I, and I sat there that day and I watched my father's belief system make an impact on his decisions. About seven months to the day later, I was sitting in that room and this time it was just me and Mike. And I was making those decisions for dad. And my belief system guided my decisions. I drive by the cemetery every once in a while. And by the way, if it's somebody in here who who put flowers in front of their grave, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, But I drive by there and, and, and just to check on things, make sure things are fine. But um, mom and dad aren't there. Their bodies are. But, but my belief system, dad's belief system, guided decisions. Now, belief is one thing, but belief ought to impact in a practical way our day-to-day life and the decisions we make. Now, I want you to see some things in the passage. Now, I understand this is a great passage on the rapture. We'll, we'll get to the rapture, but not tonight. Because there's something even more um, simple than that that I want to make sure that we, we don't miss out of this passage. For if we believe. First of all, what we believe determines our viewpoint on things. How we view things. Everybody... As we heard Ken, Ken Ham say this uh, summer during the, the summer series uh, that, we, that we had on video, um, you know, people look at things through their own particular glasses. And he was encouraging us in the matter of creation, put on our biblical glasses, you see. And ev- everybody views things from a particular belief system, what they believe. And what they're seeing, they interpret through their belief system. And, 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 and that's why you can have a Christian and someone who's not a Christian look at the same thing and come out with entirely different viewpoints. A totally different worldview. Because their, their core belief system is different. Now, how do we see that illustrated in this passage? Well, I, I want to make note of a word that is used. He says in verse 13, he uses the word asleep. Concerning them which are asleep. 
May I use a word that is a bit more harsh? These people were dead. But he says asleep. He says it again in verse 14. Uh, them also which sleep in Jesus. He uses it again in verse 15. Shall not prevent them which are asleep, you see. And if there's any question about whether these people are taking a nap or whether they're dead, well, verse 16, the end of it sort of makes that pretty clear. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now let me tell you what this is not talking about. Let's just be real clear on this. This is not talking about soul sleep. Okay, there's no soul sleep. The Bible teaches absent from the body, present with the Lord. That's for the Christian. The Bible teaches something far different for the unsaved person. Go to the book of Luke and you'll find out the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. The minute a person leaves this earth, their body dies, their soul and spirit goes one of two directions. <laughs> okay. But there's not a soul sleep that takes place. That's not talking about soul sleep. What this is talking about, as he's going to expound on in 1 Corinthians 15, but, but he's talking about it here, is the idea that um, this state is a temporary state. And they are waiting for the coming of the Lord. Now they are with the Lord. And by the way, we'll come back with the Lord. And when they come back with the Lord, they will then have a new body and that will all be reunited. And we'll, we'll get to that later, okay? But it's, it's, it's the imagery of somebody who you could just sort of tap and they wake up. They just wake up. There, there, there's something more. It, it, this is not a final situation here. And you know, for the believer, it's not. It's not. Um, I, I, I mean, if, if, if this is all there is, if it's this life and then we die and that's it, then you know what? That probably is going to change our priorities, isn't it? Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But there's more to life Amen. than this life. This life, this life is great when we live in Christ, but boy, this is a warm-up, and there's some trials that take place, and some, this is boot camp, so to speak. Uh, and and we, we're, we're pilgrims on this earth. We're going to our eternal uh, residence. You see, we're, we're going where our citizenship, our heavenly citizenship is, and, and these bodies may be sleeping. It's interesting, in the casket, They'll cross a person's hands over them. And every once in a while, depending on the circumstances, perhaps when they died and how things went with the whole process they do in the funeral home. Perhaps you've heard this. Somebody will say, oh, it looks like they're asleep. Almost like Christ is going to come and wake them up someday. You, you, you know, when the trumpet sounds, that might be loud enough to raise the dead. <clears throat> now, to an unsaved person, when, when they see that body, that is a horrible circumstance. Now, maybe they're glad, maybe somebody was in a lot of pain or whatever, and they're glad that they, they're not in pain, but, but it's like a cessation. Um, but the Christian viewpoint is much different. There is a life, a glorious life for eternity beyond this. Amen. This is just, our, what is our life? The Bible says it's even as a vapor. It appears for a little while, it, you know, it, it's, it's gone. But this, this is just a little bit of our existence. And praise God, we have, we have eternity to look forward to. We have something way beyond this to look forward to. And so the, the, the belief was that Jesus died and rose again. When the person physically died, that wasn't it. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
Jesus died and rose again. So the hope of the resurrection. This is, this, is what, this is what Paul is talking about. And right now their physical body may be sort of like it's asleep. Although their soul and spirit are with the Lord, but it's like their physical body is asleep. But there, there will come a time when that soul and spirit come back with the Lord. You see. And uh, not to get too far ahead of us uh, ourselves on the rapture, but Christ will stop in the fly, uh, clouds. And that soul and spirit will come be reunited with a new body. You say, but what if that body's rotted? The God who created something out of nothing is not deterred by a body that is decomposed. You see. So, so the viewpoint here is Paul is saying, look, I, I want to tell you, maybe they'd had somebody, and probably had some people there in the church at Thessalonica who had died. And he said, well, I don't want you to be ignorant about this thing. I want to fill you in on some details. He said, now they're just sleeping in Jesus. You know, that's sort of a comforting phrase, isn't it? They're sleeping in Jesus. Death sounds a little tough. They're just asleep in Jesus. They'll wake up someday. Now, he, he, he goes ahead and tells them they, they have died physically. They've died physically. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You see, what we believe determines how we view things. So, when you have stood at the grave of your loved ones, when I have stood at the grave of my loved ones, those of us who were in situations where that, that person it was, whose body was being put into the ground was a saved person. Uh, we view that whole situation very differently. As opposed to an unsaved person. Who as far as they're concerned, they, it's, it's over. They won't see them again. See, that has never been a part of my thinking, for example, with mom and dad. I know I'm going to see them again. <laughs> By the way, they're doing very well tonight. I'm the one who's got the problems. <laughs> you know? Um, but I'll see them again. Now, I've been apart from them before. Uh, when, when I went to school, they, they still lived in, in college. They, they still lived in California, and I got on a plane and flew to the East Coast. And um, I never went back to live as a resident in California. So I, I, I know that separation. You know what? We're having that separation now. It's just that uh, they're not in California. They happen to be a few miles farther than that and a different direction, you see. But we'll see them again. Amen. I'll see them again. Your, your loved ones who have died in Christ, you'll, you'll see them again. And, and it's a totally different view of things. Now, folks, take this out of the realm of death. Our, what we believe affects everything about our viewpoints. We just came through the election. Folks, there are literal. Let, let, let me give you something that some people are very distressed about uh, tonight. Be, because their particular candidate or whatever didn't win. And um, there are people tonight who really believe that if something doesn't happen immediately regarding the greenhouse gases and the this, that, and the other, and fill in all the blanks, that, that this world is just going to come to an end. Now, we believe in Christians exercising proper stewardship in the environment that God has given to us. So if you go out to the river, don't throw your old soda cans in it. Okay. Uh, that's not a garbage pit. God cr created, we take care of nature, we, you know, so we exercise proper stewardship. But, you know, our world's gone crazy. We give more rights to the snails and the animals than we do humans. And in our country, we are now currently giving more rights uh, to some of these critters. That wasn't a California word. than we do unborn babies. Now, it's, you know, 
again, it's, it's, it's all a difference in viewpoint. So I, I believe we ought to take care of things in proper stewardship. But at the end of the day, because I believe the Word of God, because you believe the Word of God, here's what we know. This world isn't going to end one day before God says it's going to end. And when God says it's going to end up, when the heavens and earth burn up, it'll burn up no matter how we're doing on carbon emissions. You see. And we take a balanced viewpoint on this. Yes, we're good stewards, but yeah, we see things very differently. But there are people today who are fretting. They, they think, man, if we don't get this particular politician or this particular piece of legislation or this, or this agenda through, the world's going to come to an end. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to worry about that tonight. I'll try to take care of what I'm supposed to take care of, but I'll go ahead and sleep tonight uh, because God's in control of all that. Amen. It, it just it, it matters what we believe. I mean, I, I mean, just with so many things. If we believe that this is our body and that God did not create us and we thus, you know, we're just the product of evolution and we, since we're the product of evolution, we're not accountable to anybody. It's my body. I'll say what goes on my body, what goes in my body, what I do with my body, how I use my body because it's my body and nobody has a right. If a person takes that viewpoint, then it's no wonder they say, you know what? I've got this baby within me, but it's inconvenient to my career, to my lifestyle, to this, that, or the other. Let's just, let's just a piece of tissue. Let's just, let's just get rid of it. But oh, when we understand as Bible believers that God gives life. Amen. God is the author of life. And our bodies do not belong to us. They belong to the Lord. And they are for the Lord. And they're to be used to glorify the Lord then we look at this situation very differently, don't we? Boy, we get frustrated with, uh, with, with, with the fact that this old world in which we live, why can't they see it? Why can't they see it? Because they have a different belief system. And the different belief system uh, influences how they view things in the world. We could go to the Grand Canyon tonight, and an evolutionist would look at the Grand Canyon, and they'd say millions and billions of years. And a creationist goes to the Grand Canyon and says, what an incredible thing that verifies everything God already told us. A catastrophic event like Noah's flood. And it's all right there. How can these two people very passionately argue over the same thing and come to such different conclusions? Because they have a different belief system about things. And that belief system determines their viewpoint. Just like in this passage on this matter of death. Paul says they're asleep. They're asleep. All right, now, our belief system determines our viewpoint. Here's the second thing I want us to make sure we see in the passage. Our belief system determines our response. Now, notice what he says there in verse uh, 13. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, again, he doesn't say that we don't sorrow. Of course we sorrow over the death of a loved one. Linda just got back this week from going to um, Texas and then over to Mexico, the death of her, the death of her grandmother. Uh, announced this morning, I think it was Tammy's grandmother that just died and she and Mark were, were heading there. I think the funeral was today. They were on the north side. So they left a little bit early. Of course we sorrow. Of course we sorrow. By the way, when we understand that the person who's getting put in that ground is not a child of God, that's rough. Because we understand that's not the end of their existence. That's tough. I, uh, I'd much prefer to preach the funeral of somebody who had a clear Christian testimony Amen. as opposed to preach the funeral of someone who you were pretty confident was not going to be in heaven. That's tough. Boy, that's tough.
But he says here, our, our belief system determines our response. So he says, you're going to sorrow. But you'll sorrow differently than those who have no hope. You, uh, you hear, you see, perhaps you have seen, maybe documentaries, maybe you have been at a funeral where somebody literally had no hope, and I'm talking about the weeping and the wailing. I mean just inconsolable. They have no hope. Now, di different people respond different ways emotionally. We understand that. Some cry a lot. Some... Some hold it in. You know, people have different personalities, and we understand that. But, but he says here, oh, he, he says, now these people who have died, he said, just, just remember now, you sorrow, but it's totally different than those who have no hope. Sure, you're, sorrow, you're sorrowful over the fact th that th they have departed, that they have died, but you have a hope that you will see them again. Uh, you have a hope that they have gone to be with the Lord um, you see, and, and let me just, you know, so I don't talk about your situation, I'll talk about my situation. And um, we had sort of lost mom before her body died. Okay, with Louis Bada dementia, um, she was often sort of living in a, in a different world at times. Um, we, we, we tried to uh, shield that as much as possible when she was here, obviously. Um, but at some point, the two worlds, uh, because Lewy body dementia is characterized, just the onset of it, you wake up and your life is taken over by hallucinations. And you think there's this entire world that's not there. And uh, so in some respects, I lost mom before her body died. Okay. Um, she was my mother, but I was taking care of her body. But who she was, I had lost in that. Um, and it's a, of, of, of course, it's a, it's a sad thing to see somebody die. But you know what? When she died, Number one, we knew that immediately when she took her last breath that she had gone to be with the Lord, okay? So in that, we had great hope. We also knew that she no longer suffered with Lewy body dementia. We had great hope in that as well. And so while we sorrowed, it was a very, it was a very different circumstance. But... That's what Christians can do when they're dealing with those who are asleep in Christ. Our response, our attitude toward things is very different. And, our, and, and can I say this? Despite the fact that we sorrow, our belief system ought to win out over our emotions. It doesn't mean that we don't have emotions. We do have emotions. God made us with emotions. But sometimes what happens is people are living their life, their responses are based solely upon their emotions. And for a Christian, folks, we need to allow our responses to be determined by our belief system. And so we sorrow, but that sorrow is conditioned, is still filtered through what we believe. And what he's saying to these Christians are, you've had people who have died in the Lord. Sure, you have an emotional response, but don't forget, verse 14, if we believe, it changes everything. It changes everything. Doesn't mean we don't cry. Doesn't mean we don't miss them. But it's a totally different thing. It's a different response. We, um, one of the things that we seem to be seeing so much in modern day Christianity is that a lot of the modern day Christianity is really built very heavily upon an emotional foundation. And because of that, 
people are up and down and up and down and up and down and don't seem to have a lot of sustained victory in their life. And we have got to try to encourage people to get back to a belief-based way of living. So circumstances come and go, and some of those circumstances are tough. Now, when everything seems to be going right, then it's, it, you know, people will be happy in the Lord, happy in the Lord. But when things aren't going right, do they still have the joy of the Lord? And it seems like for some Christians, they don't have the joy of the Lord anymore. Because they, they are simply living their life and their Christian life based on Circumstance, emotional response. Circumstance, emotional response. If it's good, then my Christianity is going well. If it's bad, my Christianity is not going well. And it's just a, a circumstance and emotional response. We've got to get past that. What we need to have is circumstance, a biblical response. That trumps our emotional response. Of course, when things are tough externally, there are emotions that go with that. But at some point, part of our spiritual growth is learning to quickly, the emotions kick in rather immediately, don't they? But to quickly allow our biblical beliefs to, to take prominence. And, um, and the more we mature in Christ, the faster that response takes place. So, our belief determines our viewpoint and our response, and then no, verse 18. He says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, their response, we saw at the end of verse 13, that ye sorrow not. But verse 18, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's the idea that what we believe determines our actions. What we do. And he says, in this particular context... Uh, if we believe these things, then, then comfort one another with these words. These are the appropriate uh, actions that you're going to take. This is what you're going to do. You're going to comfort one another with these words. Now again, let's draw this away from the context of people who have died in Christ. This, this matter of our belief determines, this is true with, with uh, all things in life. Our belief determines our viewpoint, our belief determines our response, and our belief determines our actions. But sometimes there's a problem. Sometimes you take a person's viewpoint or their response or their actions and compare that to their stated beliefs, and the two don't line up. To put this back into this context, here in 1 Thessalonians 4, it would be like one of these believers saying, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And I believe that those who uh, are asleep in Jesus that they'll, they'll come back with the Lord, and I believe all that stuff. And yet, at the funeral, and yet, in the days following, their life just totally falls apart. They, they live as hopeless people with no hope in the world. And you say, wait a second. You're living as if you'll never see these people again. You're living as if life has just ended. You're, you're, you're living your life, your response, your attitude, your viewpoint. I mean, the things that you're living out don't seem to match up with this belief that they're asleep in Christ, that they're with the Lord, that they'll come back with the Lord, that you'll see them again. What's the disconnect? And again, taking that out of 1 Thessalonians 4 in the context of that, it's this way in life. You have a person who says, I believe, fill in the blank. Okay? Well, their belief, that's going to determine their viewpoint, going to, going to determine their responses, going to determine their behavior or their actions, and so they say, this is what I believe. But then you, you see their viewpoints in life and their attitudes in life and their behavior and their actions, and you say, those things don't line up with what you said your belief system was. When that happens, 
then what it does is it throws into question the reality of their stated beliefs. Do they really believe that? Let me take just a moment and go a little far afield. We have seen this even in our conservative, Bible-believing institutions today, where you have had third, fourth, fifth generation people who grew up in conservative, Bible-believing churches, institutions, so forth, and they grew up surrounded by a very uh, conservative, Bible-based uh, philosophy, and if you were to say to them, what is your belief system, now that they have grown up, now that they're adults, what is your belief system? And they'll go right down the line with all that stuff, just right in the tradition, right in the heritage, right? You know, and boy, it'll sound good. But then here's what happens. Life happens. Pressures come into play. Things begin to change in the culture and society. And all of a sudden, these people who have professed a particular belief system that was sort of in line with their forefathers, they have now changed radically. Churches that used to be good churches are no, sometimes no longer good churches. People who were their leaders once professed to believe this, but now these churches have gone off the deep end. What, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The leaders professed a belief system, but they, be, they may have believed it up here in an intellectual capacity, but when push came to shove, that really wasn't the belief system in their heart. Uh, and, and, and by the way, the pressures of life reveal what a person's true belief system is. It's like Jim Berg's example with the tea bag and the hot water. You put that tea bag in the hot water and that flavor just, uh, just comes out. The, the water doesn't put the, the tea and the flavor in the tea bag. The, the hot water brings it out of the tea bag. It was already there. We just didn't know until it got in hot water. You put a man or a woman who has, professes a belief system, you put them in hot water for a while and then you'll find out what's really inside of them. And we have seen that today with churches and institutions where people who professed a particular belief system have now gone far afield. And what we now realize is that belief system was just something that they held to while it was convenient. But as soon as pressure came, they were willing to change to the extent that their real belief system would allow them to. And they have made drastic changes. And they may have children that profess a, that belief system who then will take that even further. And then maybe their children even further. And that's why you get churches and institutions that just get on a path and they keep going and they keep going. And, and this generation will take it that far and then the next generation will take it that far. And, and so, a belief system, what do we really believe? I'll tell you what we really believe. What we really believe is, uh, is what comes out in our viewpoint and responses and actions when all of a sudden we're, we're in hot water. Quickly, putting this back into the context of 1 Thessalonians 4, he says to them in verse 14, if we believe, and he lays out some things, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He talks about the doctrine of the rapture, not by that name, but the concept, uh, and, 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 and all of this, and it's wonderful. And he says, comfort one another with these words. You can have somebody there in the church of the Thessalonica that says, amen, I believe that. I'm with you, Paul. Oh, that's great. You know how we're going to know, however, if that's really what they believe? Let's, let's, see, let's see what happens when it's their loved one who dies. Now let's see how they respond. Uh, let's see their action. Let's, let's see their viewpoint now. 
Will it be consistent with the belief they say they have? Or will it be inconsistent with that? This is why it's so important for us to have, to be firmly settled in the Word of God. To be grounded in the Word of God. To, to have an anchor uh, there in the Word of God and to know what the Word of God says and to, and to, and to, and to hold to that belief. And then when we get put in hot water, we cling to it. We don't just say we believe these things and then, and, and then change on. We, we know what God's Word says. You say, Pastor, does that mean then that a person when, back in the context of someone dying, a loved one uh, who dies in Christ, does that mean we ought to just be cold and, you know, just doesn't bother me? No, 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 no. Not at all. But we have an entirely different viewpoint. We respond differently. We, our actions are different. There is a difference. You go to the funeral of someone who has no hope, it's depressing. You can, you can go to, uh, to the funeral of somebody who knew Christ as Savior, loved Christ, uh, served Christ with their life. You'll hear some, you'll hear some sobs. You'll hear some sniffling. They'll, they'll put the Kleenexes out. But there will be something different about that. Because everybody understands that body is just a body. They're with the Lord. We'll see them again. It makes a difference what we believe. Our belief determines our Father.